important for it. Okay. Uh, we just have a little more to look at in children's ministry. Um, so this today will be our uh, last class. Uh, we were basically looking at uh, uh, the messenger and methods uh, that are very important to proclaim the message uh, two children uh, in children's ministry. So in children's ministry, the messenger and methods are needed to proclaim the message. And of course, uh, we do it through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So um, in the previous two weeks, we looked at, uh, you know, what a messenger should do to effectively pro uh, proclaim the message. And last uh, class we began looking at the methods uh, a messenger or a teacher should incorporate uh, to effectively um, communicate the message in a very relevant in a productive way to the uh, children so we looked at various uh, methods that are needed uh, the first method is that we, I said that we need to choose relevant topics, which means we need to have a curriculum in place. And curriculum means, you know, choosing the relevant topics for the children uh, you are teaching. And uh, the topic should be based on the spiritual needs um, that we looked at uh, in the developmental needs of uh, children in various age groups. So if you you know, uh, have to teach a specific class and you're assigned to prepare the curriculum for that class, then, you know, how do you go about doing it? You basically go and look at the developmental needs of children in that specific age group, look at the spiritual um, needs, the spiritual um, requirements, and based on that, you, uh, you know, prepare the topics. And once you prepare the topics, then you choose the narratives that uh, uh, you know, best suit your topic. And then you uh, also another way to choose the relevant narratives is to write list down the uh, learning objectives. So we said that, you know, once you have your topics in place, then, you know, you need to begin writing your lesson plan. And it's always good to write a lesson plan. And I told you why it is important. So we are looking at uh, how to write a lesson plan. In the lesson plan, the first important thing that you need to write is you need to list out the lesson objectives or the learning objectives. What you want to achieve by teaching this lesson, what is the end result, and what you want children to learn and what you want children to practice or apply in their uh, lives should be listed out in the learning objectives. And we we looked at how to write learning objectives and we said we basically just have two or three learning um, objectives okay that will uh, which will help achieve the spiritual development of children in that specific age group now after uh, the learning objectives have been listed out you've written out your lesson objectives or your learning objectives then you write down the recap uh, basically a brief recap of what was taught last week don't go back to the entire story the narrative that you the bible narrative that you spoke about but basically um, a recap is what are the main learnings or the theological truths or the truths that you taught them and then also go on from there uh, to ask them how they applied what they had learned through the last week uh, and uh, what was their experience of, uh, you know, putting into practice what they had learned. So that is a recap. And then you begin with the introduction for your um, lesson. And we spoke about introduction, how you need to go about introduction, what you need to write, what you need to say. And we said um, one of the good things for introduction is to have a good attention getter. And I I. Uh, shared uh, quite a few attention getters with you. Uh, you will also receive uh, or get a lot of attention getters from the website, from the net, but be very careful which uh, site you're going to uh, because there are a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, good children material that is available in uh, Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons. You need to be very careful what kind of uh, website that you're looking into and getting your uh, attention getters or your object lessons. Um, another way to introduce the lesson is to have, uh, uh, you know, to start off with a good object lesson. Uh, object lessons can also be uh, instead of an attention getter you can you can use an object lesson an object lesson also can be an attention getter you can use an object lesson either for the introduction uh, as an attention getter or uh, to reiterate a concept or a truth that you're teaching uh, uh, in the middle of your teaching content or to reiterate the lesson, what you have taught in the end. Uh, object lessons uh, are very, very powerful uh, ways of uh, teaching concepts, truths, which will help children to remember when they look at those specific objects and God can use, or the Holy Spirit can use that to recall what you had taught them even, you know, many years later in life. So an object lesson is basically used to illustrate a concept, a, a point, a truth, a learning, or a story by combining it with an object uh, object uh, or a trick or a visual aid just to help children remember the lesson. So object lessons, attention getters are very, very important because children learn not just by hearing, but also seeing, uh, doing. So you have tactile learners, you have children who are kin kinesthetic, bodily kinesthetic learners, um, uh, interpersonal um, uh, intelligence who learn uh, this way. Okay, so uh, you can uh, use this as a visual aid. It's very, very uh, powerful. And these object lessons basically attract the attention of the children. Uh, it focuses their interest um, on the main truth that you are trying to teach them. Okay, And also these object lessons will serve as a reminder to children again and again of the lesson um, they are, um, uh, you know, learning about when they look at these objects. So how do you do an object lesson? I, I showed you various objects le lessons uh, uh, last week and I told you that's not all for my creative mind, but I took them all off the net. Okay, so it's a lot of object lessons are available and you can just... Uh, you know, type the uh, topic or the, the narrative, Bible narrative, and you will uh, get a lot of object uh, lessons which you can use. So how do you use an object lesson? Basically, you introduce the object, you connect the object to what it represents. Um, uh, like, for example, I used the, the last object lesson I did for my class um, last week was the, remember the egg and the spoon and that vessel? So I said, you know, the egg is um, resembles us. We are very delicate because you know, throw this egg and, uh, you know, uh, smash it on the ground, it splatters, or you throw it a, a, on a hard surface, it will break. So our lives are as delicate as um, this egg. And, you know, um, you can tell them, if I take the spoon and hit this egg, what happens? Uh, you know, the children will say it break. So you can say the spoon, um, represents uh, Satan or represents hardship, difficulties, temptations that we face. And we, are, we can be so open to the attack of the evil one. We can face so many problems and difficulties. Uh, but when we receive salvation, we are very privileged children of God because we have God's protection. So you can use that vessel, cover that egg, and you take the spoon and hit it all around. And then you ask them, do you think my egg uh, is broken? Some children will say yes, some children will say no, and you show them that the egg is not broken. And you can say like how God protects them, okay? And you can tell them that, you know, when we stay under God's protection, how do we stay under God's protection? You can you, you can use this object lesson even for rules, obeying God's rules, commandments. Um, but if you step out of your boundary, you are open to the attack of the evil one. Okay, so uh, that is an object lesson. I also showed you the uh, 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 object lesson of an apple, right? Uh, initially, it's there in that uh, thing. Can you just uh, that PPT? Um, uh, so I think I've I, I shared about the apple, right? No, with your uh, with with all of you. Okay, you just uh, 
So how do you usually cut an apple? Don't show the image now. How do you cut an apple usually? You take a knife, you, you dice it down, right? You cut it down in the, in the center, OK? But um, if you, what if you dice it down in the middle like this, slice it down in the middle like this? Can you show that, uh, please, what happened? Yeah. OK, so here is uh, what happens when you cut it down in the center. What do you see there? What do you see in the center? What do you see in the center? A star. Yes, thank you, Subhashish. A star. Did you ever know that when you, when you cut the apple, you dice it down in the center, there is a star? How many of you knew that? Any thumbs up for anyone who knows who uh, who knew that there was a star? I'm yeah, green about it. I didn't know that there is a star. Yes. So usually when we cut the apple like this, right? And when we when you open it, you find seeds there, and you kind of remove that. But you know when you dice it down in the center, there is a um, star. So if you can use this object lesson, it's a very powerful truth to tell children that you know, God has given each one of us gifts and talents, you know, and all of you are, uh, you know, star material, you know, you are all born for to do something extraordinary, you all can be superstars, um, you know, God has created you to be superstars, to be people who can, you know, put on display his wisdom, his strength, his skills um, that he has given you. So none of you here are useless and hopeless. And you can tell them that, you know, many of us think of ourselves as useless and hopeless because we are always cutting the apple like this and we're looking at, you know, nothing in us. But God has placed a star in each. Go and tell your parents that, you know, take me to the hospital. I want to do a scan. And basically means that, you know, your God has given you gifts and talents. He's put um, Because you don't know what is your gifts and your talents. But, you know, once you know it and you excel in that, you can, you can uh, be, um, you can be good in that. You can excel. You can, um, you know, show yourself to be um, a star in front of everyone. So a very simple object lesson, but a powerful concept that you can uh, teach children. Now, also children uh, compare themselves with each other and they think they are you know, either not smart, they're not clever, they're not good looking, they're not intelligent. So you can tell them that God has created all of us smart, intelligent, um, uh, you know, we are beautiful because we are created by uh, gems. I in class, so I think in the Euro American countries, they call it as MMs, uh, uh, you know, and um, the various colors, so you can use toffees or chocolates, which are various colors. But, you know, the content in is the same. It's chocolate in everything, but strawberry, um, banana flavor, but everything inside is not, it's not strawberry for pink. It's not banana flavor for yellow. It's not, a, um, it's not grape for, um, uh, 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 for uh, uh, you know, violet color, but all of the contents inside is just chocolate. So you can say, you know, God has created all of us different. Um, we all look very, very different, but he has put, you know, uh, uh, skills and talents in each one of us. And so we look different, but he has made us all smart, intelligent, uh, and he's given us skills and talents. So very powerful truth to uh, 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 to explain a concept to children which they usually will not accept, which they usually will not uh, believe. Now, um, you know, when you're talking about faith and fear, another uh, good object lesson that you can use is, you know, a um, um, uh, 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 plastic uh, uh, drinking water, drinking um, 
bottle, a plastic drinking bottle. And you know, uh, you can say you can have two of them, of them the same size, one with the uh, cap on it, the other one, the cap is removed. And you can say the one with the cap is uh, a person, resembles a person uh, who is full of faith, okay? And the, the 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 one without the bottle, without the cap, is a person who resembles a person who is uh, has no abs a little faith, but is filled with fear. Okay, so they are just open to any kind of fear and anxiety, and just just take it in because they are open. Okay, so what happens when uh, Mr. Faith? You know, the person with faith or misfaith, you know, goes through problems and difficulties and you take that bottle with the cap and you try to crush it. You know, you try doing it, you know, after you drink and uh, uh, drink water, juice from an, a, a plastic bottle, you try putting on the cap and crushing it. Will the bottle crush? The bottle does not crush with the cap on. So you can say that, you know, uh, when you have faith in God, you will face problems and difficulties, you know, pressures, anxiety from all sides. When you try to, you know, tries to crush you and to put you down. But when you have faith in God, your know, faith is able to uh, give you the strength, uh, uh, put your hope and belief in the character and the nature of God. And he gives you the strength to overcome those pressures. But, you know, if Mr. Faith or Miss Faith is, go, uh, sorry, Miss Mr. Faith, fear and misfaith fear is going through problems and difficulties what happens so you take the bottle that resembles fear you can have it stuck on that bottle fear and when you crush it the bottle you know uh, without the, the 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 cap easily just gets crushed because it's plastic so you can say see what happens when you are filled with fear you know fear um, you, you give in to fear, you know, you it destroys your life. You're not able to do what you can do. You know, it um, it it, um, uh, it stops you from being who you are and fulfilling your plans, the plans and purpose God has for your life. So just two plastic bottles, but you no know, powerful concept of faith and fear that you can teach. Another uh, impo uh, good object lesson that. Uh, you know, I use is, you know, when I tell children that it's, you know, uh, when you tell a lie, you know, quickly ask God for forgiveness and don't do it again. Because if you keep on telling lies, it becomes a habit. And so children are not uh, convinced about that. So then I use this object lesson. I call a child up in front and I have them, you know, put their fists together and I tie a, a thread or a string. You know, I say this child told a lie or this child copied for the first time or this child stole money from their uh, from the dad's pocket or from their mother's uh, uh, handbag. And what happens, you know, they felt guilty and they asked God for forgiveness and they didn't want to do it again. And they were able to break free from that uh, that bondage of saying lies or uh, you know from the bondage of um, uh, of stealing so you just tell ask the child to release their fists and what happens when they release their fists they easily are able to you know uh, pull off the string or that thread from their hand but you say you know this child a uh, copy the first time you have their another child come up in front and you have their fists like this and then you know you say they copy to the first time, the second time you keep rolling, third time, fourth time, you know, they lied or they copied or they stole and uh, make that, um, you know, the string uh, or the thread very strong around them and then ask them to break free. It's difficult to break free. So you can tell children how these things become a bondage, a stronghold. And when you want to break free, it's very, very uh, difficult. So just a simple object lesson, but such a powerful uh, 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 and just a thread that you can teach such a powerful um, uh, concept or a truth. I'll just share um, a three more and then we'll move on. Uh, now, for example, you know, uh, you're telling them if you if you like the Old Testament, God said, if you break one law, it's like breaking all the laws that he has given us. So you can take a chain and you can remove one uh 
part of that chain, you know, the one of the uh, the links that is, you know, holding on to the chain. And you say, hey, this chain, one link is cut or one link is broken and this chain is useless. I can't use this chain, you know. So it's like you're saying that, you know, you just break the law or you don't keep God's commandment, uh, break one of his commandments is like breaking all the 10 commandments, or just breaking all of the 613 laws that he has given us. So just a, uh, a chain, but you know, you can teach them this powerful concept. Another thing is about, um, you know, um, 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 a good, a bad company corrupts good character. Okay, so you can use uh, Take two sheets of paper. One, you can have it fully soiled. You can rub mud or you can, you know, just color it with, uh, make a, a, a black patch with crayon. And you can show them that one sheet with the uh, uh, crayon and that black patch. Okay. And then you have another sheet and you can say, okay, this sheet with the black patch is a child who's, uh, who's, who's very naughty, who tells lies, who beats everyone, who copies in class, uses bad words. And this is a child, the white sheet, you can use another plain white sheet. This child is good, you know, uh, does what is right, obeys their parents, doesn't cheat, doesn't use bad words. Now, this child is slowly becoming friends with this child who is naughty, who is doing everything that is bad. And the mother wants this child don't join with him or her eh, because you also will become like them. So the child does not agree. The child does not believe uh, uh, his or her mother. And so, you know, so they meet and they talk and they, uh, they, they, and mud a bit and you can, then when you pull it off, you can show them that there is, a, you know, small patches of uh, dirt or uh, the black, uh, you know, crayon that has come on this white sheet as well. So you can tell them, you know, the word of God says that a bad company corrupts good character. So it's very important to choose your friends very, very wisely. You can say, hey, they're not going to rub off on me. You know, what bad things they're doing, I'm not going to do it. But see what happened to this you know the sheet of paper so just a, a, a sheet of paper with just a small you know black coloring or a soiled sheet of paper but can uh, bring out such a powerful truth okay so you can uh, think of various object lessons and you can use them uh, even when you're preaching god's word you know, uh, it's very powerful. I know a pastor, He, I get many of uh, my object lessons from the sermons that he uses um, on Sundays when he is uh, preaching. Okay, so you can use these object lessons. These are powerful truths and the children will just remember and God can use that. The Holy Spirit can also use it later on to reiterate the truths that you have taught them. Any questions so far? Any doubts, any questions? Okay, I'll take the silence for a no and we'll move on. So we looked at uh, the introduction, which is, uh, you know, how to, uh, what you need to say in the introduction, how, how, how much time you need to give uh, for the introduction what you can do in the introduction, the attention getter and the object lesson. Now we'll move on to uh, the main uh, content in the lesson plan, which is the main teaching content. Okay. And I said, when you write, you, you need to write down the en entire lesson plan. Um, so I'll tell you, of, I, I mentioned a few reasons last week. I'll mention a few more reasons. So when you're writing out the entire lesson plan, you know, generally as adults, we tend to speak to children just like we're speaking to another adult, right? Um, and uh, we can use unfamiliar uh, big words that children may not understand, uh, which they'll not be able to catch. So it's important, you know, when you're writing, you would, and you again, when you go back to read, you say, hey, you know, I've used, um, uh, you know, this, this word, I don't think children in my class will understand. For example, if you're teaching them prodigal son, you know, they might not understand what is the meaning of a prodigal. Okay, so what is a, 
word that you're going to, a simple word that you're going to substitute it with. So you can erase or, uh, uh, you know, uh, scratch out prodigal and use a simpler word. Now, for example, you say the prodigal, you know, uh, spent all his money in loose living. Our children will be wondering what is loose living. I only know loose clothes, loose shoes, you know, uh, or my socks is loose, uh, my tie is loose. I don't know what is loose living. And they might not ask you. So you need to, you know, explain or you need to scratch out that word and explain what you uh, think, what you're going to say and write it down. Now, for example, you're, you're talking about Pharaoh. You know, they will not understand who is Pharaoh. So you can say, you know, uh, the kings in uh, 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 in the land of Egypt were called as Pharaohs. If you say talk about famine, straw, nowadays children don't know what is straw, you know, plague. Um, so, you know, all of these things you need to, when you write, you write it down and you go back, you would look at it and then you say, hey, my children may not understand this. So what am I going to say to make it simpler, to help them understand? So keep the language very, very simple because we're teaching children. We're not speaking to adults. Okay. The second thing is when you're writing on the lesson plan, you will, uh, you will realize that you have mentioned a lot of Christian jargons like, uh, you know, righteousness, justified, we are redeemed we are sanctified you know we are saved by grace through faith the blood of jesus cleanses us you know covenant the lord's supper the lord's table the lord's communion and they'll be wondering you know how can the blood of jesus cleanse us uh, i know that blood is only there in our bodies is important for life and some children be wondering you know what is righteousness what is justified and you can just say it because when you're speaking it, you just say it, hey, children, you know, we're all um, saved by grace uh, through faith. And you can just move on because you're a Bible college student, you know, or you are spe you think you're speaking to an adult and you can just move on. But they would not have understood a thing. So that is why it's so important for you to write out everything that you're saying in the lesson. Because when you spot these words, you will stop and you'll say, hey, how am I going to explain these terms? And how am I going to replace them? How am I, what how, illustration am I going to use uh, to explain this to uh, children so that they can uh, remember? And also you need to know how you're going to explain these Christian jargons to a child who's in third or fourth or fifth grade compared to a child or a teen or a preteen who is in eighth, ninth, and tenth grade, because you need to explain it to them quite differently. So it's so important for you to write down so you can keep the language simple, even the uh, Christian jargons. Also, you would um, you would also see whether the main truth is, you know, your, your main truth is running throughout the lesson. If you're kind of transgressing, you're digressing, uh, sorry, you're digressing and you're moving away from the main truth, then you can come back and you say, hey, I have to mention what is the main truth, what is the main point, I've kind of not mentioned it, um, uh, you know, in the last few sentences or paragraphs. So that is why it's so important for you to write it down. OK, uh, the third thing is, you know, um, our goal as children's church ministers or Sunday school ministers is not just to narrate a, a, a Bible narrative, a Bible incident, a story from the Bible, but it's also important to teach them deeper truths or theology. Now, you might be wondering, hey, is it can we teach theology to children? Yes, because if you look at their textbooks, uh, their science, math textbook, they're learning so much. You now, why not? teach them the deeper truths in God's word. So for example, if you're teaching them about creation, what do you think are the deeper theological truths that you would like to for them to know in creation? Any thoughts? Covenant. Sorry? I think covenant. Covenant? Yeah, our understanding about uh, blood covenant you know, might be a little too theological for children. No, no, no. You can teach them. We teach them the covenants. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, I was asking about creation. Um, what are the some of the powerful truths that you can teach them or theological truths that you can teach them when you're teaching them uh, on creation? I would, for instance teach them that God is the source of all things. Everything 
starts and ends with God. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lubega. Jeffina says the power of God's word, the Trinity, yes, Trinity there in creation. You know, God spoke and everything came into being, into existence, the power in God's word. So you can talk about how powerful God's word is and the Bible is God's word and how powerful it is and how important it is for them to read God's word and to speak God's word in their life. So that gives them a more uh, uh, important basis to read God's word than just uh, you know doing it out of a ritual. What else? The fall, the sin, yes, okay. You can also teach them how God's word brings, when you speak, when God speaks his word, he brings things into existence. Things that are not, he brings it into existence. So the things that are not there in your life, when you speak God's word over that, you know, how it will happen, it will come into being, it will come into uh, fruition, it will come into um, existence. Also, uh, what else can we talk about creation? When God created Adam and Eve. What theological truths can we bring about in God creating Adam and Eve? I would tell them that God created both male and, and female, so we are all equals in God's eyes. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Still, God had a concept of a family where a man and a, a male should, um, a woman and a female should make up a family, not a man and man or a female and female. Also, God created the man and female in order to continue the human race because when a man and a, um, and a female get married, they can continue the human race contrary to the lesbians and the homosexuals. Okay, thank you, Lubega. Maybe that is for uh, the older classes, which is good. Yes, can, uh, Jeffina says we can teach them about obedience, how God created everything for good, and how the devil tries to twist God's word. Okay, when He created Adam and Eve, you're talking about how God created us in His image and His likeness right and so you're talking about image and likeness you're saying so what do we understand by that and you can say god is a spirit being that means he has no form and shape so what does it mean when god created us in his image and likeness so you can talk about what is the meaning of image what is the meaning of likeness and then you can go on to tell them you know the powerful truth that you know god is holy he created us in his image and likeness means he created us holy. You know, God is sinless. He created us sinless. God never dies. He created us never to die. You know, God has a mind. He gave us also a mind so that we can understand, relate with God. God is sovereign, which means he has a will. He also created us in his image and likeness, which means he gave us a will so then they are beginning to understand wow god created us you know perfect just like him and so we can say now you know uh, are we holy are we sinless uh, they'll say no do we all die uh, yes uh, but uh, did god created uh, uh, create us that way god created us you know without sickness without any shame guilt pain uh, do we have sickness shame guilt pain yes why because of the fall. So then you're telling them how God created them. He created them uh, perfect in his image and likeness. And then you can go on to say that God wants us to continue to be in his image and likeness. That's why he died on the cross. And we have eternal life. And eternal life means that we come back to who God created us initially, like he created Adam and Eve. So that is a powerful truth. Uh, a, a, a theological truth that you can teach um, children, okay? Uh, now, you're talking about faith, okay? Uh, we'll move on to another topic, faith. Um, just imagine you're talking about the blind beggar, Bartimaeus. So what important theological truth about faith can you bring about from this narrative? 
Or what can you teach them on faith? When we trust God, all things are possible. Okay, all things are possible when we trust God, okay? Anyone else? What is faith? Faith is you don't see but yet you believe. So you can tell, you can say that, did ba could Bartimaeus see? Uh, no, he was blind. Did he see Jesus doing any, performing any miracles? No, you know. But uh, what did he do? He just put his faith and belief and he knew this was the only opportunity in his life, you know, to uh, uh, to make a bring about a change in his life for him to be able to uh, see and to be healed. And so, you know, he tries his best to reach out to Jesus when Jesus was leaving the city of Jericho. But all his efforts were in vain. Okay, all of his efforts were in vain. So, what would you do if you were Bartimaeus and no one was? helping you to get to Jesus because everyone wanted to get themselves to Jesus. There was a large crowd and here was Bartimaeus, you know, trying to move and he was falling on people. He was falling down and people were getting irritated. They just picked him up and put him in a place and told him to stay still there and not to move anyway. He can't see. So there's no point in him seeing Jesus. And no one thought that, hey, you know, they can take him to Jesus to be for his eyes to be open so that he can see. Um, but, you know, uh, faith is, uh, you know, we all have faith, but we could have had faith like Bartimaeus if you just stand in the corner and say, poor me, I tried my best, nobody's trying to help me uh, to get to Jesus, you know, I think I have to live my rest of my life, like this is, this is my faith, you know, and there's nothing like faith in God's word, but there is faith, you know, and so uh, what did Bartimaeus do? He did not give up. The faith is uh, uh, you don't give up till you get what you want. So what did Bartimaeus do? You know, he shouted with all of his strength, his all of his might. And what did people say? Tell him, shh, be quiet. No, don't make such a big noise. You know, what will Jesus think? Just keep quiet. Why are you shouting? But, you know, Bartimaeus shouted all the more and it caught Jesus's attention. See, so that is faith. Faith is you know, you don't say, I tried, I did my best, you know, this is all I can do and just live with what you have. But faith is, uh, you know, you want something, you get it at any cost, you press in and get what you are looking for, which you know is your right. You, uh, it was uh, Bartimaeus's right to be healed, to see, uh, you know, and so uh, Jesus is no, Jesus notices him and stops and and what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, "Be healed," you know, see again and enjoy the beautiful creation I created. What does Jesus say? Your faith has healed you. So then you're telling children that it's you know you want to see healing in your life and you want to pray for people. You know you want to see them healed. What is important is faith. And what is faith? Faith is you don't see but you believe. Faith is you don't give up till you receive what you want. Okay, so just uh, a, a blind beggar story, but you can teach them these powerful uh, truths. Okay, what about Zacchaeus' story? What powerful theological truths can we bring out from Zacchaeus' story? Come on, I just don't want to, to hear Jeffina and Lubega. Can others also speak up? What theological truths can we teach children from Zacchaeus' story? Okay, Jeffina says Jesus came to save sinners. Okay, what else? Come on, class. What theological truths can we teach children from Zacchaeus' story? Even rich can come to the Lord, okay? We can teach them that God knows our thoughts from afar. 
Okay, thank you, John Paul. God knows our thoughts from afar. We can teach them about salvation. Zelotoli also says salvation, yes. Now, I would just uh, talk, think about, I think two powerful truths that come to my mind about Zacchaeus is what caused Zacchaeus to change? You know, people would have told him, people would have mocked him, if he would have felt guilty, but you can just say, see, he was so used to greed. Greed had become so used to his life that he didn't mind if people, but money was so important in his life, he didn't mind if people spoke to him, did not speak to him, if he had relationships, no relationships, if people were making fun of him, people didn't want to speak to him, he did not care. So you can talk about how sin, you know, brings us to a point where we just don't care and we're just so happy with our sin. Sin becomes everything. We don't even bother about uh, uh, anyone or uh, anything at all. But what caused Zacchaeus to change? Did Jesus speak a sermon in his house? Did Jesus tell him the bad things he's doing? Did Jesus tell him that he's going to hell if he does not change? Jesus tell him he's going to be put into the burning fire and, you know, he is going to have various problems and difficulties like, you know, some of that. Sometimes your parents will tell you when you disobey or your teachers in children's church tell you, you know, remind you all of these things. Does Jesus do that? The children will say no. You know, then what caused Zacchaeus to change? You know, the very presence of Jesus in Zacchaeus' life changed him. Jesus didn't have to speak a word. Even when Zacchaeus felt all that guilt and sin and he was uh, voicing it out, Jesus didn't say, Hey, Zacchaeus, I knew, all, I know all of that. I was just waiting when you will tell me. doesn't say a thing. So you tell children the very presence of Jesus in your life can change you, you know. So you can say some of you uh, say that you're born again, but you're still living, you know, um, you're doing the same old bad things. But, you know, the very presence of Jesus is so powerful that it can change you from doing the wrong, those, those bad habits, those weaknesses, totally change you like it changed Zacchaeus and this is a true story that happened to Zacchaeus and if you're talking about repentance you can you can say repentance children is not just saying uh, sorry uh, Zacchaeus didn't pretend and say Jesus I'm sorry I will uh, give back four times I will uh, give double of what I have uh, taken and all of those things but he goes immediately and does it. That is repentance. So repentance is not just telling God you're sorry because you don't want to go to hell. You want to go to heaven. You want his blessings. You want to do well in your studies. You want to uh, excel in your sports or whatever. But repentance is not just telling sorry, but it's to stop doing what you are doing. It's total change around. So that is another important theological truth that you can uh, teach them okay uh, we can go on with so many stories I'll just stop with uh, one more jo Joseph story you know um, Joseph's story for children you know you can it's very powerful truth you can bring about temptation for the older kids basically in seventh eighth ninth and tenth grade you can tell them you know think about Joseph he was basically kind of your age you know 13 to 15 years and what does he say when he faces temptation? He says, how can I sin? Whenever you copy or you use a bad word or you're watching something dirty on TV and internet which you shouldn't be watching or you, uh, you know, you're stealing something from somebody. Uh, have you ever thought, hey, Jesus is watching me? You know, God is watching me. But look at Joseph, you know. He's, he's thinking here, you know, how can I sin against God? And um, I would tell children when I read this for the first time in my life, I was like, wow, I never thought of it when I did all of those bad things. I never thought, you know, hey, I'm sinning against God. I'm doing something. I'm going to do something that is wrong in God's sight. And also you can, you know, talk about Joseph's attitude. You know, Joseph... Um, when he was sold as a slave in his Potiphar's house or he was in the prison, he didn't say, he, hey, you know, I'm not slave material. I'm not going to mop. I'm not going to clean. I'm not going to wash. I'm not going to do all of these things. I'm a rich man's son. I've never done anything and just sit in a corner, you know. 
uh, what if he had done that? That was a wrong attitude. But you know, Joseph was sincere and honest. Of course, the Bible does not say, but the Bible tells us that God caused Potiphar to look at Joseph's hard work, his good work, and uh, he made him the manager from a slave. So you know, some of you children are thinking, you know, how can I do well in studies? How can I get good, better marks? How can I do be a big, uh, uh, best cricket uh, player or a, a, or a football player? It requires hard work and the right attitude to be honest, sincere, hard working. So you know, you're just teaching them these truths from God's word that God is looking at our attitude and our attitude really matters to God and how we spend our time and how uh, we, uh, what we do with the opportunities and the things that God has given to us. And if you're not good stewards and faithful stewards, then how God will not give us the increase and uh, bless us. But why was, why did jo God cause Joseph to you know, prosper and to become the prime minister or the manager in Potiphar's house or the, you know, uh, the, uh, the one who is in charge of the jail. Not because God favored him more than anyone else or loved him more. No, God loves all of us because he looked at Joseph's attitude. So another powerful truth. So, you know, all of these things are very important that we think and, you know, we teach children at a very young age so they can catch it young, they know it young, they can receive it and that you can just speak into their lives. Okay, we'll stop here before we just move on into further into our lesson plan. We'll do that after break. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll... Uh, Go for a break and come back. Thank you, everyone.